Okay, we're reading the Chronicles of Narnia, uh, A Horse and His Boy, Chapter 5. The title is Prince Corin. My dear sister and very good lady, said King Edmund, you must now show your courage, for I tell you plainly we are in no small danger. What is it, Edmund, said the queen. It is this, said Edmund, I do not think we shall find it easy to leave Tashbaan. While the prince had hoped that you would take him, we were honored guests, but by the lion's mane, I think that as soon as he has your flat denial, we shall be no better than prisoners. One of the dwarfs gave a low whistle. I warned you, Majesty, I warned you, said Salopad the raven, easily in, but not easily out, as the lobster said to the lobster pot. I have been with the prince this morning, continued Edmund, he is a little more... Little used, more is the pity, to having his will crossed, and he is very chafed at your long delays and doubtful answers. This morning he pressed very hard to know your mind. I put it aside, meaning at the same time to diminish his hopes with some light common jest about women's fancies, and hinted that his suit was likely to be cold. He grew angry and dangerous. There was a sort of threatening, though still veiled, under a show of courtesy in every word he spoke. Yes, said Tumnus, and when I supped with the Grand Vizier last night, he was the same. He asked me how I liked Tashbaan, and I, for I could not tell him I hated every stone of it, and would not lie, and I would not lie, told him that now, when high summer was coming on, my heart turned to the cool woods and dewy slopes of Narnia. He gave a smile that meant no good, and said, There is nothing to hinder you from dancing there again, little goat foot. Always provided you leave us in, in the exchange a bride for our prince. Do you mean he would make me his wife by force? exclaimed Susan. That, my dear Susan, said Edmund, wife or slave, which is worse. But how can he? Does a Tisrock think my brother, the High King, would suffer such an outrage? Sire, said Purdy unto the King, they would not be so mad. Do they think there are no swords and spears in Narnia? Alas, said Edmund, my guess is that the Tisrock has very small fear of Narnia. We are a little land, and little lands on the borders of great empires were always hateful to the lords of the great empire. He belongs to blo he longs to block them out, gobble them up. When first he suffered the prince to come to care Paravel as your lover, sister, it may be that he was only seeking an occasion against us. Most likely he hopes to make one mouthful of Narnia and Arkenland both. Let him try, said the second dwarf, as, as sea, at sea we are as big as he is, and if he assaults us by land, he has the desert to cross. True friend, said Edmund, but is the desert a sure defense? What does Salopad say? I know that desert well, said the raven, for I have flown above it far and wide in my younger days. You may be sure that Shasta pricked up his ears at this point, and this is certain, that if the Tisrock goes by the great oasis, he could never lead a great army across it into Arkenland, for though they could reach the oasis by the end of their first day's march, yet the springs there would be too little for their thirst, and all those soldiers and their beasts. But there is another way. Shasta listened more attentively still. He that would find that way, said the raven, must start from the tombs of the ancient kings and ride northwest so that the double peak of Mount Pyre is always straight ahead of him. And so, in a day's riding, or a little more, he shall come to the head of a stony valley, which is so narrow that a man might be within a furlong of it a thousand times and never know that it was there. And looking down this valley, he will see neither grass nor water nor anything else good. But if he rides on down it, he will come to a river and can ride by the water all the way into Arkenland. And do the Calarminis know of this western way? asked the queen. Friends, friends, said Edmund, what is the use of all of this discourse? We are not asking whether Narnia or Kellerman would win if war arose between them. We are asking how to save the honor of the queen in our own lives out of this devilish city. For though my brother the Peter the High King defeated the Tisrock a dozen times over, yet long before that day our throats would be cut, and the queen's grace would be the wife or more likely the slave of this prince. We have our weapons, King, said the first dwarf, and this is a reasonably defensible house. As to that, said the king, I do not doubt that every one of us would sell our lives dearly at the gate, and they would not come at the queen but over our dead bodies. Yet we should be merely rats fighting in a trap, when all said. 
Very true, croaked the raven. These last stands in a house make good stories, but nothing ever came of them. After their first few repulses, the enemy always sets the house on fire. I am the cause of all this, said Susan, bursting into tears. Oh, if only I had never left Care Paravel. Our last happy day was before those ambassadors came from Callerman. The moles were planting an orchard for us, oh, oh, and she buried her face in her hands and sobbed. Courage, Sue, courage, said Edmund, remember. But what is the matter with you, Master Tumnus? For the fawn was holding both his horns with his hands as if he were trying to keep his head on by them and writhing to and fro as if he had a pain in his insides. Don't speak to me, don't speak to me, said Tumnus. I'm thinking, I am thinking so that I can hardly breathe. Wait, wait, do wait. There was a moment's puzzled silence, and then the fawn looked up, drew a long breath, mopped his forehead, and said, The only difficulty is how to get down to our ship, with some stores, too, without being seen and stopped. Yes, said the dwarf dryly, just as a beggar's only difficulty about riding is that he has no horse. Wait, wait, said Mr. Tumnus impatiently. All we need is some pretext for going down to our ship today and taking stuff on board. Yes, said King. Yes, said King Edmund doubtfully. Well then, said the fawn, how would it be if your majesties bade the prince to a great banquet to be held on board our own galley in the Splendor Hyaline tomorrow night, and let the message be worded as graciously as the queen can, to, can to contrive without pledging her honor so as to give the prince a hope that she is weakening. This is very good counsel, sire, croaked the raven. And then, continued Tumnus excitedly, everyone will expect us to be going down to the ship all day, making preparations for our guests, and let some of us go to the bazaars and spend every minute we have at the fruitiers and sweetmeat sellers and the wine merchants, just as we would if we were really go giving a feast. And let us order magicians and jugglers and dancing girls and flute players all to be on board tomorrow night. I see, I see, said King Edmund, rubbing his hands. And then, said Tumnus, we'll all be on board tonight, and as soon as it's quite dark, up sails and out oars, said the king. And so to the sea, cried Tumnus, leaping up and beginning to dance. And our nose, and our nose northward, said the first dwarf, running for home, hurrah! For Narnia and the North, said the other one, and the prince waking the next morning and finding his birds have flown, said Purdy Ann, clapping his hands. O oh, Master Tumnus, dear Master Tumnus, said the queen, catching his hands and swinging them as he danced, you have saved us all. The prince will chase us, said the other lord, whose name Shasta had not heard. That's the least of my fears, said Edmund. I have seen all the shipping in this river, and there's no tall ship of war nor swift galley there. I wish he may chase us, for the splendor Hyaline could sink anything he has to send after her if we are overtaken at all. Sire, said the raven, you shall hear no better plot than the fawns, though we sit in council for seven days. And now, as the birds say, nest before eggs, which is as much to say as let us all take our food and then at once be about our business. Everyone arose at this, and the doors were opened, and the lords and the creatures stood aside, for the king and queen to go out first. Shasta wondered what he ought to do, but Mr. Tumnus said, that Lie there, your highness, and I will bring you up a little feast for yourself in a few moments. There's no need for you to move until we are all ready to embark. Shasta laid his head down again on the pillows, and soon he was alone in his room. This is perfectly dreadful, thought Shasta. It never came into his head to tell these Narnians the whole truth and ask for their help. Having been brought up by a hard, close-fisted man like Arshish, he had a fixed habit of never telling grown-ups anything if it could be if he could help it. He thought they would always spoil or stop whatever you were trying to do. And he thought that even if the Narnian king might be friendly to the two horses, because they were talking horses of Narnia, he would hate Aravis because she was a Calamini, and either sell her for a slave or send her back to her father. As for himself, I simply daren't tell him that I'm not Prince Prince Corin now, thought Shasta. I've heard all their plans. If they knew I wasn't one of them, they, they'd never let me out of this house alive. They'd be afraid I'd betray them to the Tisrock. They'll kill me. And if the real Corin turns up, it all comes out, then, then they will kill me. He had, you see, no idea how noble and freeborn people behave. What am I to do? What am I to do? He kept saying to himself. What? Hello? Here comes that goaty little creature again. 
The fawn trotted in, half dancing, with a tray in his hands, which was nearly as large as himself. This he set on an inlaid table beside Shasta's sofa and sat down himself on the carpeted floor with his goaty legs crossed. Now, princeling, he said, make a good dinner. It will be your last meal in Tashba'an. This was a fine meal after the Kalamini fashion. I don't know whether you would have liked it or not, but Shasta did. There were lobsters and salad and snipe stuffed with almonds and truffles and a complicated dish made of chicken livers and rice and raisins and nuts. And there were cool melons and gooseberry fools and mulberry fools and every kind of nice thing that can be made with ice. There was also a little flagon of the sort of wine that is called white, though it is really yellow. And while Shasta was eating, the good little fawn, who thought he was still dazed with sunstroke, kept talking to him about the fine times he would have when they all got home, about his old good father, King Loon, of Arkenland, and a little castle where he lived on the southern slopes of the pass. And don't forget, said Mr. Tumnus, that you are promised your first suit of armor and your first war horse on your next birthday, and when your highness will begin to learn how to tilt and joust. And in a few years, if all goes well, King Peter has promised your royal father that he will himself make you a knight at Care Parabelle. And in the meantime, there will be plenty of comings and goings between Narnia and Arkenland across the neck of the mountains. And of course, you remember you have promised to come for a whole week to stay with me in the summer festival. There will be bonfires and all-night dances of fawns and dryads in the heart of the woods, and who knows, we might see Aslan himself. When the meal was over, the fawn told Shasta to stay quietly where he was, and it wouldn't do you any harm for to, to have a little sleep, he added. I'll call you in plenty of time to get on board and then home, Narnia and the North. Shasta had so enjoyed his dinner and all the things Thomas had been telling him that when he was left alone, his thoughts took a different turn. He only hoped now that the real Prince Corrin would not turn up until it was too late and that he would be taken away to Narnia by ship. I'm afraid he did not think at all what might happen to the real Corrin when he was left behind in Tashban. He was a little worried about Erebus and Bree waiting for him in the tombs, but then he said to himself, Well, how can I help it? And anyway, Erebus thinks that she's too good to go about with me so she can jolly well go on alone. And at the same time, he couldn't help feeling that it would be much nicer going to Narnia by sea than toiling along the desert. When he had thought all this, he did, he did what I expect you would have done if you had been up very early and had a long walk and a great deal of excitement and then a very good meal. And were lying on a sofa in a cool room with no noise in it except when a bee came buzzing in through the wide open windows. He fell asleep. What woke him was a loud crash. He jumped up off the sofa, staring. He saw at once, from the mere look at the room, the lights and shadows all looked different, that he must have slept for several hours. He saw also what had made the crash. A costly porcelain vase which had been standing in the windowsill lay on the floor broken in about thirty pieces, but he hardly noticed all these things. What he did notice was two hands gripping the windowsill from outside. They gripped harder and harder, getting white at the knuckles, and then up came a head and a pair of shoulders. A moment later, there was a boy, Shasta's own age, sitting astride the sill with one leg hanging down inside the room. Shasta had never seen his own face in a looking glass. Even if he had, he might not have realized that the other boy or was, at ordinary times, almost exactly like himself. At the moment, the boy was not particularly like anyone, for he had the finest black eye you ever saw and a tooth missing and his clothes, which must have been splendid ones when he put them on, were torn and dirty, and there was both blood and mud on his face. Who are you? said the boy in a whisper. Are you Prince Corin? said Shasta. Yes, of course, said the other, but who are you? I'm nobody. I'm nobody in particular, I mean, I'm, said Shasta. King Edmund caught me on the street and mistook me for you. I suppose we must look like one another. Can I get out the way you just got in? Yes, if you're any good at climbing, said Corrin, but why are you in such a hurry? I say we ought to. We ought to be able to get some fun out of this being mistaken for one another. No, no, said Shasta. We must change places at once. It'll be simply frightful if Mr. Tumnus comes back and finds us both here. I've had to pretend to be you, and you're starting tonight secretly, and there were there and and where were you all this time? 
Well, a boy in the street made a beastly joke about Queen Susan, said Prince Corin, so I knocked him down. He ran howling into a house, and his big brother came out, so I knocked that big brother down. And then they all followed me until we ran into three old men with spears who were called the watch. So I fought the watch, and they knocked me down. It was getting dark by now. Then the watch took me along to lock me up somewhere, so I asked them if, they, if they'd like a stoop of wine, and they said they didn't mind if they did. So I took them to a wine shop and got them <laughs> got I took them to a wine shop and got them some and they all sat down and drank till they fell asleep. I thought it was time for me to be off so I came out quietly and then I found the first boy, the one who had started all the trouble still hanging about. So I knocked him down again. After that I climbed up a pipe onto the roof of a house and lay quiet till it began to get light this morning. Ever since that, I have been finding my way back. I say, is there anything to drink? No, I drank it, said Shasta, and now show me how you got in. There's not a minute to lose. You'd better lie down on the sofa and pretend, but I forgot. It'll be no good with all those bruises and a black eye. You'll just have to tell them the truth once I'm safely away. What else did you think I'd be telling them, asked the prince with a rather angry look, and who are you? There's no time, said Shasta in a frantic whisper. I'm a Narnian, I believe. Something northern anyway, but I've been brought up all my life in Kellerman. I'm escaping across the desert with a talking horse called Bree. And now quick, how do I get away? Look, said Corin, draw from this window onto the roof of the veranda. And you must do it lightly on your toes or someone will hear you. Then along to your left and you can get up to the top of that wall if you're any good at all as a climber. Then along the wall to the corner, drop onto the rubbish heap you will find outside and there you are. Thanks, said Shasta, who was already sitting on the sill. The two boys were looking into each other's faces and suddenly found that they were friends. Goodbye, said Corin, and good luck. I hope you I hope you do get safely away. Goodbye, said Shasta. I say, uh, you have been having some adventures. Nothing to yours, said the prince. Now drop lightly, I say, he added as Shasta dropped. I hope we meet in Arkaland. Go to my father, King Loon, and tell him you're a friend of mine. Look out, I hear someone coming. <laughs> and that is the end of that.